for theoretical physicists, why is that of interest? Why are we interested in the physical world? And what do obscure things like black holes and wormholes, what do they really tell us? Why are they useful things to study? And I think realistically it's because it's not so much the items that we study themselves, but the questions they generate on the way. This is the wonderful thing about science. You can press click pretty much anything in science, but the things you discover on the way are obviously far more interesting than anything you could ever imagine. So theoretical physics, I think realistically, for those of us who don't perhaps have much experience with physics, can be broken down into two things. We could have the physics of the very small, and we have the physics of the very large. So I'll start with the physics of the very large, because that's what I have the most experience with. That is general relativity. This is our theory of gravity. It was developed by Einstein, who replaced the previous theory by Newton. Uh, unlike Newton's theory of gravity, which described gravity in terms of masses being instantly attracted to each other, Einstein's theory of gravity did something very, very different. It removed notions of absolute space and absolute time, and instead replaced it with this very geometrical interpretation of gravity. So instead of forces, what we really are experiencing when we have a gravitational field is if you put matter or energy into the universe, that creates a local distortion, and that distortion is what we experience as gravitational field. Now, when general relativity was first published, um, there was a lot of resistance to it. Uh, Einstein did have to take quite a while for it to get noticed. And the first interesting solution from gravity actually came about in the trenches of World War I. The first black hole solution was found by Carl Schwarzschild, who was in the trenches of the First World War, and he solved the Einstein solutions, uh, field equations, and he found something very remarkable. He found a very condensed object from which even light couldn't escape. And this object seemed to have a singularity abreast of an infinitely heavy point at the center. And it was surrounded by this sphere called an event horizon. And nobody in astrophysics took it seriously. They thought this was just theorists playing around with equations, could have no actual significance to the universe. It wasn't actually until the 1950s when we understood that stars like people, they're born, they live, and they die, and how they die depends on how large they are, that we realized that actually black holes are not an esoterical thing at all. They are the natural gravestones of stars very much heavier than their suns. You've perhaps heard of supernovae, yes? Okay, so stars, 10 solar masses or more, 10 times heavier than the sun, they explode in a very, very violent way. But stars much heavier than that are just too heavy to explode, and they collapse in upon themselves. Beyond stars, general relativity has significance in your everyday lives. How many people use the stat nav here to get to this location? None of that would work without general relativity. Okay, so we have these satellites high up in Earth orbit, and without general relativity, they would be useless. Okay, because they're falling, they, they're in orbit, and because of the gravitational field of the Earth, um, you have to make slight corrections for them to work down here on the ground. So that's all well and good. We have the science in the very large. Uh, conversely to that, we now have the science of the very small. And this is a very, very different universe to the one we, we've, we're used to thinking of. Uh, in the science of the very large, we have a definite statements. We can make definite statements about where the planets are in the night sky. We don't think they're probably in the constellation of our view because we know exactly where they are. And we have definite statements we can make about positions and about velocity. All of that changes when we get down to the quantum world. The quantum world is very different. We don't have solid little objects when we think of particles, we tend to think of them as sort of smeared out things. They're described by very interesting things called wave functions, and they evolve over time. And the quantum world is very different. We can no longer say with any definite, prob with any definite certainty where a particle is. We can only give a probability that it's within some particular region. But quantum mechanics, although very, very strange, there aren't a lot of, unlike general relativity, which has a lot of geometrical pictures associated with it, quantum mechanics is very difficult. It doesn't actually have any physical analogues, and it's very difficult to get a grip on what it actually really, really means. Uh, but having said that, quantum mechanics is very su successful. The reason all our iPhones and our mobile phones work is because quantum mechanics allows us to do solid state physics, and without that, it wouldn't work. So here's the thing, we have quantum mechanics, we have general relativity, and they're both very successful, but unfortunately they both fundamentally disagree on the nature of space-time. General relativity says that space-time is flexible, you put matter and energy in, it curves and distorts, but quantum mechanics says no, that's not what happens at all. Uh, space-time is fixed and impassive, like a stage which the elementary, elementary particles of nature, they sort of dance and exist on the surface. 
Um, so what we've been trying to do, the modern grail, holy grail, if you like, of modern theoretical physics, is to try and find some way of bridging to the two, to come up with a quantum theory of gravity, this theory that would allow us to see how gravity works at quantum scales, and conversely, how quantum mechanical effects can affect large-scale things like gravity. And the only region, any, any way we can think of testing this and doing this, is around the event horizon of a black hole. Okay, and this comes about to something, a very interesting concept. Is anybody here familiar with entropy? Familiar with entropy? There's a wonderful law in, the, in physics, the second law of thermodynamics. It's one of the most depressing laws in nature. It basically says entropy increases, which is a fancy way of saying the more you put things together, the more they keep falling apart. And that's the essence of the second law of thermodynamics. So you have to put energy into stuff constantly. You have to mow the lawn to stop the weeds. Uh, my entropy in my office every day at work it gets very exponentially large. We have to constantly put work in to keep, to keep entropy at bay. And in the 70s, people realized, in particular people like Stephen Hawking and Birkenstein realized, it's not just light bulbs and things here on the Earth. All things in the universe have to obey the second laws of third dynamics. So do black holes. So the interesting thing is, is there a measure for an entropy of black hole? Well, yes, there is. It turns out the event horizon is a nice natural measure of geometry of black hole, uh, of uh, the entropy of a black hole. So the interesting downside, that is, is that if things have entropy, then they must radiate because they have to come into thermal equilibrium with their surroundings. So this gave the Arias the astonishing idea that black holes are not just fixed static objects. They are, in point of fact, slowly evaporating over time. In fact, any black holes that would have formed in the early universe uh, would be slowly evaporating now. And in fact, uh, black holes, as the smaller they get, the quicker this evaporation process is. So they, at the end of their lives, they actually explode in a shower of gamma rays. Now, in cosmological terms, that wouldn't be a best, big significant event, but if one went off in this room, it would do a great deal of damage. So it's here on this boundary where we have general relativity meeting quantum mechanics uh, that scientists, theoretical physicists came up with a new area of for physics to describe this called quantum field theory. Uh, and its first success, if you like, was describing this process of how uh, black holes obeying the second law of thermodynamics can radiate away their mass slowly over time. And this is what we are currently working on. There are two approaches. Uh, there's string theory, which I don't particularly care for. Uh, then there's loop quantum gravity, which I find only marginally preferable. Uh, these two approaches are looking at trying to quantize gravity, trying to make gravity like quantum mechanics. Um, I am of the personal opinion, and it doesn't mean it's right because I have no evidence to support this, that in actual fact what's needed is what Einstein did a long time ago. We need a new revision of space, time, matter and energy. And I think perhaps part of the problem, again this is only a feeling on my behalf, is that we've been misled by time. We are too used to thinking of time as the ticking of a clock and of a physical objects, length contraction of rods. And in actual fact, there's something far more fundamental. It's interesting to me, at least, that entropy and time seem to only flow in one direction. They seem to me to be uh, encapsulated, perhaps, in something far more significant. So that's what I spend my time doing, uh, trying to work on a new theory of quantum gravity. The reason it's important for technological reasons is if we get a quantum theory of gravity, then overcoming gravitational fields would be very, very straightforward. You would have a technology that would take mankind to the stars. You would no longer need rockets. You would be able to control gravity at the quantum level, and it would provide astounding insights into this extraordinary universe within which we live. Would that do? <laughs> so for anyone who's joining us, maybe just watching online, but uh, has only just tuned in, um, that was a very brief crash course in um, black holes, quantum field theory, general relativity, life of the universe and everything from Paul Abel, who works for the Centre of Inter Interdisciplinary Science at the University of Leicester and has um, also been a co-presenter on the BBC's Sky at Night with Sir Patrick Moore. Um, we're going to hear now from David Henkel, who is an artist, and I'll let you lead the way. Um, yeah, I'm slightly blown away by that. <laughs> I'm just going to walk out of it. No. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I'm an artist. I, as an artist, I think I've always been fascinated by science, which I've, I think I've got my parents to thank for forcing me to do uh, scientific subjects as well as art subjects. Um, and and there's, there's been various points in my life where science is sort of... Even, even on a very basic level, has sort of uh, pushed my art further forward. Um, 
Over the last few years, I've moved away from painting. I used to do a lot of painting and sound work um, and had the chance to, um, on a residency at the University of Central Lancashire where I did my MA in Site and Archive Intervention, um, I was asked to sort of join the Solar Physics Group um, as an artist in residence. Uh, and from that point, um, started working with uh, images of the sun which NASA gets from its solar dynamic observatory and um, so I suppose in a way the where the science and the art cross over um, and it's really interesting that we're actually in a church here today is that I suppose what I try and do is take some of what Paul's been talking about and then create an emotional impact with some of that and create something maybe a little bit more poetic um, and something that says something about our place in the universe on a much more emotional level. Not that I don't think you do that <laughs> at all. I think you definitely did that. Um, so yeah, I did my degree at the Slade um, and then went travelling for a bit and ended up in Preston by chance um, after coming back from travelling. Um, and originally started working in the printmaking department at the University of Central Lancashire. At the time I was doing lots of drawings of little characters and experimenting with sort of shaving foam sculptures and I've always been very interested in the idea of quantum theory and that idea that, um, you know, almost anything is possible if you have, uh, think about a sort of multi-universe theory, like it must be possible that anything could exist. And what, what would it be that sort of makes all these things and how do you break down into the, the smallest little pieces of things like, you know, this is a line and that's a triangle and then how do these things combine to create who we are and so what else can you create with that, I think. So that's... I've always had those, those sort of scientific concepts in the back of my mind. Um, at the University of Central Lancashire, I was making uh, screen prints based on these. And then one day, I saw, I saw this uh, table that's been used for cutting paper. So a lot of the artists within the printmaking facility were making etchings, uh, relief prints, screen prints. And what I noticed was that this table, where people have been cutting paper, had an enormous mass and range of marks on it that all seemed to sort of um, be, um, I guess, centred around the one edge where people tended to sit. And I thought this was fascinating and it kind of looked to me like sort of comets flying across and star charts. It just had this amazing sense, or was it, it, it even sort of looked like sound, I think. Um, and it was that that sort of inspired me to then start making work that was more, um, I guess, more to do with uh, the overlooked and the everyday and, and kind of processes um, and process of processes of, I suppose, unconscious collaborative activity. So, you know, hundreds of people had contributed to this table over, say, 20 years of the life of this space. So I, I inked the entire table up, took a print of it, um, and it looked even more amazing because it picked up even the most sort of hairline fractures and cracks that was on this table. Um, from that, I noticed that outside the Outside the printmaking department, where there was a gallery, there was all sorts of chewing gum splats uh, on the floor. And I thought, oh, this is actually the same as the, as the table. Um, and so my actual MA, my final MA project was uh, in chewing gum <laughs> and chewing gum splats. Um, and I suppose, again, another crossover with Paul is that I then, I directly observed these chewing gum splats uh, and made, say, in a, I guess, a floor plan about the size of this room, and they started at the door, and I think people tended to drop them near the door, so either as they were going out, or more likely as they were coming in, they were like, oh, check the chewing gum out. And so there was this amazing spread, a concentrated mass, and then this spread, and that sort of felt like, a, like an explosion, and again, like, a, like sound. Um, and so I mapped by photographing each paving slab, and then retiling all that into Photoshop, um, and then created this big map of where the chewing gum was, Painted the chewing gum pink originally to see if people would notice it, and no one noticed it because I think chewing gum can be pink. Can be pink. <laughs> Bubble gum is pink, so in everyone's mind that's that. So I ended up painting it with gold leaf um, and created an interactive sound piece based on the distribution of chewing gum splats. So mapped each coordinate, gave gave everything an x y coordinate, translated that into a frequency of sound, put all those together, and then put lots of um, sensors into the space and uh, worked with two brilliant musician technicians, Dan Wilkinson and uh, Leon Hardman, and created a, an interactive sound piece. So then people would walk in and out of that. And, uh, and yeah, I think, I think we put 
the high pitch notes near the door and then the bass notes were much further away so you definitely got this sense of progression from that i i started working with the head of electronic and digital art at uclan um, and we did one sort of failed piece with the sun where he we tried to uh, project the sun onto the solar panel at uclan with, uh, which was a great conceptual idea of, of projecting the sun onto a solar panel that would then power the projector that was projecting the sun onto the solar panel. But of course, solar panels absorb light, and so this didn't, it didn't work. Um, Entropy. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So we ended up, actually, we had to do a lot of work to make that happen. We had to put this huge cover on, on, <laughs> on the solar panel, and uh, it was a bit of a disaster. But from there, I got asked to do various other projects. Uh, I was telling Paul earlier, during the transit of Venus in 2012, um, we were asked to do something to do with the transit, with the physics department. But we ended up um, putting on a piece of work at the uh, church in Much Hall, which is where Jeremiah Horrocks, who was one of the first scientists to observe... The first. The first. <laughs> uh, to observe the transit, um, he taught there, I think, and actually went... To, he used to go to that church. Uh, and this was the second transit of our lifetime. Um, there won't be another one for about 120 years. And we actually did a, a live link-up with NASA. So we, NASA were using their Solar Dynamic Observatory to observe uh, the transit. Um, and so we ended up projecting that above the altar in the church and had a saxophone clarinet duet from a composer called Julia Russia uh, at the ingress and the egress, which is about 11 o'clock and 5 in the morning. And, and that was amazing, because actually... It, and then it was the first time that I sort of used a religious space to um, talk about our place in the universe. Um, and it was really, we, the programme that we put together was like a little parish um, church brochure. So you, I guess using, um, I suppose, the design and the ritual of that space and putting signs back into it to create something more than, more than both, I think. Um, and then after doing that, um, and the chewing gum piece was asked to do another piece with the sun um, after the, the sort of fairly unsuccessful solar panel piece. Um, and yeah, we did one year in the life of the sun. So we got the images from NASA's Solar Dynamic Observatory, which are free for everyone to download. It's an amazing resource. Um, and created one year's worth of the sun, one year in the life of the sun uh, in half an hour, and then created a soundtrack to go with it. Because for me, what worked with um, the piece, which was called Venus in Sol Visa in the other church, uh, was the sound. And that actually, that was the sort of missing piece that then allowed people to have a much more emotional response to it. So we looked at using the, the sound data, uh, sorry, the light curve data from the images to influence the sound, but eventually actually just composed a soundtrack that was an emotional response to the footage. Um, and that was shown in the covered market in Preston, um, again, I worked with Dan Wilkinson on that. Um, and we got uh, Operation Sound System, who are a dub reggae um, sound system in, based in Preston, uh, to put their speakers around it and create this, I guess, enormous wall of sound. And people actually thought it was the sun, and we didn't tell them it wasn't, <laughs> because actually it, it worked as a piece, it sort of, it works. But that, yeah, that soundtrack includes, like, the me hoovering up in my room like sort of um, my cat Bernard used to tread around his cat litter all around the house and I'd sort of go around sampling sounds that he was making and uh, sounds from the cat litter being hoovered up and stretching them and pitch shifting them I guess to create something that was fairly uh, sinister and overwhelming and then that piece has evolved now to being we showed it on a, on a cylindrical projection screen the idea being that we as humans we worship the sun um, but obviously the Earth goes round the sun, but the idea was that then the sun would go round like this and people would follow it round. So it was on a, a black rear projection screen, uh, 10 metres wide, 4 metres high. Um, and then recently it was shown at Light Night Leeds and we ditched that entire setup and actually hung it above the altar. So it went back to um, the other piece and it was much more successful. And we managed to convince the vicar to let us put a massive sound system in his church. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that's hopefully that's in a nutshell, a disorganised nutshell of what I've been doing recently. Okay. Uh, anyone who's just tuned in, you're listening and watching um, Art, Astronomy and Astrophysics. Uh, before we heard from Paul Abel, who is a theoretical physicist, and you've just heard David Henkel, who is an artist who has 
produced The Sun at Night, which is an ongoing collaborative sound and video installation, amongst other things. So I would like to the group now a chance to weigh in with some questions or any observations um, for either David or Paul. If anyone's got any burning questions that they'd like to open with. This is uh, in the second you said that there was no visual representation of quantum mechanics. I would Yes, there's a very famous lecture actually where Roger Pat, the founder of quantum mechanics, was Paul Dirac, uh, a very sort of quiet man. In fact, the uh, uh, he, uh, there was a unit of, uh, for, for, for quietly spoken people in the physics department at Cambridge, there was a, a thing called the unit of the Dirac, which was one word uttered per hour. So, because Paul Dirac didn't speak an awful lot. And he very famously gave a, a, a conference an explanation about quantum some ideas about quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, Roger Penrose, who worked, a very, very famous mathematician who worked with Hawking and others in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, still working uh, on his singularity theorems and very other things, tried to get Dirac to elucidate things like spin and you know, various quantum mechanical concepts. And he just wouldn't. He, uh, uh, Penrose said, Do you want to, do you have a picture in your mind? And he just said, Nope. <laughs> that was it. So it is very difficult because. I think as physicists, certainly for me, I, I think very visually, um, we were talking about this earlier, uh, it's a myth that physics is all done with equations. You, that, you know, that's, it's, you might argue that then if that's true, then building a house is just about bricks. It's nothing can be further from the truth. It's the final end product. And what you do particularly is you think about ideas. Mathematics is not about equations. It's about concepts, abstract ideas, which we link together uh, using equations because it's the best way we have for doing that, and that's why it's such a great way of describing nature. Um, the thing is, uh, is that when, that's fine for things like general relativity, when you have things that have obvious pictures and analogues, but in the quantum world, you make use of higher dimensional algebras and things that don't necessarily have straightforward pictorial interpretations. And so when that's combined on the top of physics, it's very difficult to pull out a conceptual geometric picture, perhaps, of things like spin and various other things. So it is, this is one of the reasons why quantum mechanics is quite difficult to conceptualize. Things like wave functions. I don't really know what a wave function is. I teach about wave functions. I use wave functions. But as a picture, I, I, in my mind, I still don't have a picture for what a wave function is. So is it words? Are you thinking like, uh, are you thinking in math or words? Images. Like Images. So, for example, uh, it's very, very, very difficult to describe to somebody who doesn't um, to work in this kind of area. So, there's a type of uh, it's called an integration. Has anybody here done any maths at all? Or I know you have your Cambridge, but <laughs> anyone here? Okay. So, a fundamental thing in maths is adding stuff up. Okay. You can add lots of stuff up, and if you add stuff up, you want to get a finite answer, right? Okay. So take that a layer away and imagine you're adding up points on a line okay and this leads to an area of math so it's a very useful tool that we call integration okay imagine now you're only allowed to walk along that line you need for your physics problem to get from one end to the other but there's a hole in the line okay that's uh, we would, now, if you're only using one dimension, then so walking along the number line is a big problem, especially if the hole is infinitely deep, you can't get across. However, if you have a two-dimensional number, like a complex number, you can go around. Okay, so this would be the kind of things you would think about, perhaps when solving a physics problem that involves these kind of mathematical arguments. You would think about what the thing looks like and how you would walk across the landscape or alter things. That's certainly how I do maths. I, the, the last thing I do is write it down which means the last thing I ever do is write things up. I publish on cosmological timescales because it takes me a long time to write things up. But you don't, as a physicist, I think, sit there with pens and paper. That's at the very end. You, you sit there with ideas. I have a chair in my office called my thinking chair, which I haven't sat in for a long time, actually, sadly. But uh, that's, where you, that's where you do it. And it is difficult when the concepts don't have these analogues where, you, where walking across the line now no longer perhaps has a real physical meaning. And the challenge is to pull out the physics from the maths, because uh, it's all very well having mathematics in a theory, but the, the, na the knack is knowing what it's telling you uh, and be able to switch on to what the physics means. Does, was, what was the question? <laughs> how, do you, how do you think about 
you... Okay. If it's not visual. Okay. okay. That's, that's so... Uh, yeah, but I try and make it visual, and I think that can lead to problems, actually, if, yeah. if your picture isn't I, right. I remember uh, my maths teacher, probably when I was about 12, drawing a hypercube. Yeah. Um, which I was sort of really fascinated by, and, but this idea that actually you couldn't, that really wasn't really necessarily what it looked like because you couldn't step out of your own dimension to draw. It's what it looks like at one instant of time. Yeah, yeah. which was amazing. And I, I've seen animations of that, and, and I actually ended up using it in an artwork where I'd, um, I'd taken all the words from the first chapter of Genesis and, and taken all the words out apart from the word and, and, and <laughs> put a piece on in a gallery and made a, made a physical version of that drawing of the hypercube right. with black elastic. There's interest in the hypercube you mentioned. You could view it through two different ways. As a truly four-dimensional spatial object that to us looks like it's changing, or a three-dimensional object changing yeah. with time. So some interesting interplay there with space right. and time happening. Have you seen, um, it's a painting by Salvador Dali, um, and it's kind of semi-religious because there is sort of Jesus floating in front of a cross, except yeah. it's not a two-dimensional cross, it is the net of a hypercube. Which, oh, yeah. as you, if, you think, if you kind of think each side of the six sides, so you could represent the net of a hypercube as one cube, one cube, what, if yeah. that makes sense. Yes. And that's a kind of, I suppose, one way which has been represented in visual art. I mean, another artist I've just thought of who has tried to create visual representations of quantum mechanics, interestingly, and uses imagery mm. from hypercubes is, um, I've got his name written down, Conrad Shawcross, if you've ever come across his work. Oh. Those are quite often, they're kinetic and they yeah. use light and they cast shadows and there's kind of forms within forms or forms that are modular. Mm. And I suppose it's not a true diagrammatical representation of, you know, a quantum mechanical equation, but it's the kind of essence of it. And I guess maybe as artists, that's the best we can ever hope to mm. do. Not that it's... Well, I think you'll cut more leeway as artists. We have to be truthful. Uh, I c we can't say, let's do a cubic interpretation of Schrodinger's <laughs> equation. It wouldn't be terribly useful. But it, in some way, uh, it's interesting that maybe not having those constraints, you can get something interesting out of that. I mean, there's possibly a difference between fact and truth. I don't know if art is ever fully factual. I think it tries to be true sometimes but um another artist you reminded me of um david uh, when mm -hmm. you were talking about your um your shaving foam sculptures and your figures yeah. was i don't know if you've ever come across um adrian pritchard's um yes before because he yeah. makes work with um non-newtonian fluids and if anyone doesn't know a non-newtonian yeah. fluid doesn't behave in the way that for instance Fairly viscous is that substance the, that is that water the glue does. machine? The glue machine. Yeah, I yes. vaguely know him actually. He lives and works in Blackpool. Mm. Um, and he's been touring that and creating amazing installations that I think the public get involved with as well. There's something about his work that's very playful. and Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. But he, um, it's funny the fact that you used um, a saxophone in your uh, work, The Transit of Venus, because yeah. he also did a, 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 a commission the Institute of Physics a few yeah. years ago where he had kind of cornstarch or some non-Newtonian ah, fluid yes. on top of a speaker and it was a piece yeah. of saxophone music that was making it kind of dance. Ah, and amazing. So that, that kind, kind of, of musical, musical accompaniment to something that's, well, physical yeah. or... Um, I've, seen, I've seen quite natural. a few videos of those but I've been reluctant to try them out because I, I really like my speaker. <laughs> 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 I don't want to touch them. But I know I've seen that on a sort of... Um, a vibrating metal plate as well and you get various patterns and standing waves. Yes, yes. I mean, when you, when you were saying the wave function, is there anything in the real world, such as going to the sea, that has, does that have any... Not really. Any Again, it, it's, it's very difficult, no, because it's a probabilistic interpretation. Yeah. Of, it, it describes how a particle, not that it's a solid thing, yeah. how it evolves in time from one place to another. So it's, I, I would shy away from saying it's like waves crashing on the, yeah. on the beach. It's not really, it's not really like that. Yeah. It's funny though, isn't it? The language kind of makes you use yeah. the of cube. And, you, know, you think naturally of a cube. Nothing yeah. could be further from the truth. Yeah. It is. There's a, there's, there's a, science is full of bad names. There's a, there's an object on the moon called the straight wall, which is neither straight nor a wall. There's, <laughs> we have these names in science that, that actually yeah. can be very misleading. That's uh, funny. It's interesting that you talk about um, visual as well. Like um, one of the tutors from my site and archive, archive course, Lavena Hamid, 
we had a discussion once and she said actually not everyone is visual and so sometimes people don't think if I said chair or orange most I think a lot of people have an image of an orange and whether that's like you know a cartoon drawing of an orange an actual orange an orange cut into segments mm. there's all sorts of different ways of doing it but actually she said not everyone is like that so when you're talking to some people you may, may not, smell it I you suppose you may not yeah. be able to use yeah. that way of just talking to yeah yeah Yeah. An object, it produces a taste or a smell. I think the fundamental kind of um, similarity I've noticed, noticed here, here is the kind of uh, attempting to make something which is invisible or unrecognisable, visible or at least audible. Yeah. In the case of I'm thinking about your um, your 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 work with the bubble gum and kind yeah. of taking something which is seemingly chaotic or has little to no pattern and creating mm. something understandable by I suppose, you know, charting it, putting it on a yeah. graph, and then applying a, an old, you know, a form of logic on so top. Into a different yeah, language. I suppose. In, yeah, in that sense, it's it's. Yeah, I did see it as like, uh, you know, um, like a star map or something like that, and I was very very careful about getting this as accurate as I could. Um, I know that's something that Paul's involved <coughs> as well with sort of uh, your planetary observations. Yes, I, I make drawings, but yeah. I'd, so I, a bit of an iconoclast, I guess. Uh, the modern way of doing astronomy is to take very good quality uh, images or CCD images of, yeah. of the night sky. And I prefer to draw it. But so what you have, you have to be careful. So you borrow artistic techniques, but for scientific reasons. Yeah. So, and that can be quite a challenge, especially yeah. as I do them in colour, that takes... I was interested, I was... Before we started this talk, I was reading up on a few of the things you did. I was blown away by wormholes, so I'm not going to totally go there. But I mean, I'm fascinated by them. But one of the things you said was that um, you preferred to draw them because actually photography made things more artistic. And I wondered if you could expand on that. Well, it's not that they make... It makes... Well, there is two aspects of it. It's not that it's the make them more, um, le it's less accurate. Uh, it, you know, we have some very good me measurements of the yeah. stars and things in the sky because of photographic techniques. But there is certainly a tendency to emphasise things that were perhaps more subtle. Right. Okay. It, it's certainly the case that with every astronomical image I've seen, yeah. photographed taking some splendid images of, uh, of things in the night sky, they never really look like what they look like in the eyepiece. Yeah. Uh, and so I didn't want to be joining in and creating, you know, really nice high-res planetary images, I thought, well, I, there was a whole body of, of scientists that used to draw the planets and the objects in, through their telescopes long before we had photographic techniques. And so I really wanted to carry on that line of, uh, of doing that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's more ac accurate, but what I would say is it is a more realistic impression of what you see when you look through a, a telescope. And this is important when you've got new people coming to, you show them Saturn through yeah. a telescope and they've seen Hubble Space Telescope images, <laughs> yeah. and, and then they see this blurred, fussy thing <laughs> that looks like a steam pudding in the eyepiece. <laughs> And it really does ma it damages expectations. Yeah, yeah, so it's about managing expectations. Uh, that's right. And it is true, and you're an artist, you'll know much more about this than me. Uh, by looking at an object and drawing it, you are interacting with it more. It's certainly the case, I found, after drawing at the telescope, I've been doing it now for 20 years, I see a lot more because I've been looking at it. I know how to look for things. And that doesn't just apply to to drawing you look yeah. out the window on the train yeah. and see a lot more subtleties yeah. in shades of green in leaves Absolutely, shadows yeah. that quickly come and go and pass between the cracks of life things yeah. like that that you really pick up which i think i owe to the amateur astronomy side the drawing side yeah. of amateur astronomy i think that's the same with all senses you know you could say that about listening as well like if you went and <laughs> recorded something or actually when you you have headphones on and you record something you get a really odd sense of what's going on which is really interesting mm. um you know, that's something that artists have done for a very long time. And the thing that you miss, I guess, uh, that's always been a bugbear of mine, that, that if, if someone, not that people shouldn't, but if you're doing a portrait from a photograph, and people will, and I have in the past for money, painted portraits <laughs> from a photograph <laughs> of people's dogs and stuff like that. Um, but you miss out on something. And, and I wanted to mention it earlier. We, you know, we're talking about other artists that have been in, influenced by science or scientific concepts. and. That's happened all the way, you know, that's, there's always been this connection, even from, you know, you go as far back as Leonardo da Vinci, mm. but then you look at people like Picasso and Braque who were interested in breaking up space. And for me, that, that has, mm, I don't know whether it fits with quantum physics or it fits it's with some other form of physics, but it's that idea that you can shift and you can move around something, whereas then with that, that photograph, 
there's nothing else you can then no do. it's it's you could blow it up you it, could it, color it, it stops stuff. it from being static yeah and turns it into an object that's dynamic that you can then check yeah. it's quite interesting those because those people of that era were not what you would describe as those scientists or artists they were simply no. natural philosophers which i think was much more healthy i think professional science is not necessarily a good thing or professional artists no. to be able to do lots of different things is far more boring, especially when you get the overlap between yeah. ideas and concepts that's, where interesting stuff that's right the boundary between one discipline and another is far more interesting than the center of a discipline i've yeah. always found i'm really happy that you brought up picasso um yeah. earlier and because maybe not quantum mechanics but yeah. general relativity i believe was actually an influence an influence of his because um there was a French physicist called um, Henri Poincaré mm. um, who wrote a very influential book called Science and um, Hypothesis, mm. uh, which was an influence on Albert Einstein. Uh, a friend lent it to him whilst he was working as a, a patent clerk in Bern, I believe. Yeah. Um, but also it found its way to Pablo Picasso and that very famous painting of um, uh, Madame, uh, the Yep. The nude, you know the one the I mean, it was <laughs> yeah, influenced by that. The nude descending the stairs, or is that? No, that no, was, no, that's, no, thank that's you, shop, thank it? you, yeah. yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so that kind of the way in which you can look at something from multiple angles at once, different perspectives kind of held, you yeah. know, by one. So absolutely, I yeah. think there, there's, a, there's a connection there. Yes, and Poncar himself did a lot of work on... Uh, notions of moving backwards and forwards through space and time. And there's a, a thing, a mathematical object called a group, Poincaré symmetry, is absolutely a central structure to space-time. It means that various things like uh, that we want preserved. Uh, fundamentally, it means things like Poincaré symmetry and the Lorentz group means that it's the reason why if the two, two of you get in, in a lift, both your mobile phones work, right? It'd be very strange if your mobile phone worked in one area and not another. By fair, I don't mean you can't get a signal, uh, but I meant it, it stopped actually <laughs> functioning. And that's because we want physics that works everywhere. It, it shouldn't matter about coordinate systems. And this was an interesting thing that Poncre and others inbuilt into physics was that it doesn't matter where you do your physics, you can always find a coordinate transformation between two things and you get the same answer, which is important. Yeah. <laughs> there was a... Um a uh, curator and an art theorist called, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, it was an artist called Billy Kluver, but he was a scientist by day and he predicted in 1966 that there would be an increasingly large amount of collaboration between artists and scientists and also that it would be a benefit to scientists and engineers and, you know, people from outside the arts and I think um, I think we're seeing it now, but I think we're seeing a resurgence mm. because many physics labs, you know, including Triumph in Canada, INFN in Italy, CERN, CERN thank you, yep, the yeah. European <laughs> Organization for Nuclear Research, all have artist residencies. Sometimes they have exhibitions, yeah. they have events. Mm. Um, so it's it's caught on now. In actual fact, there was a lot. There's been a lot of people doing it over time. Uh, uh, it's not it's not really a new phenomenon, as you say. It's more mm. popular. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of Keith Brown. He's a sculptor at Manchester yeah, Met, Keith. and his time forms are essentially about Mobius strips. Yeah. And my partner, who was at the university, was working with him at the time. Uh, I got chatting to him in the pub, and it was quite interesting. This kind of stuff. The work stuff he was working on, the toruses that he was cutting up in knots, were exactly the same types of topological problems string theorists were working on. Yeah. And it was it really, we had some fascinating discussions about what it meant to bring to life. He was trying to bring these shapes to life in a three-dimensional way using holograms, yeah. these very twisted surfaces. He originally stuck, was doing them in wood, wasn't he? That's right. It was really uh, remarkable. On. Very, and then very he early sort of Mac computer. That's right. And then he moved into three-dimensional yeah. imaging. Uh, uh, but the fundamental problems were the same of trying to, you know, using toruses to represent yeah. different things. It had a lot of basis in theoretical physics. So it had some very interesting conversations. But everyone's doing that now. But back then, it was very, very rare to find, yeah. you know, an artist who was said, "I've had some of this. It looks like stuff I've heard in theoretical physics." Is it? Yeah. It was quite refreshing to to, to <laughs> meet that. What you're saying about Taurus is just then. Does this come back to Poincaré again? Because of course he said the, there's a fundamental difference between 
a shape without a hole in it and a shape with That's a hole That's right, in it. yeah. It comes to uh, as a whole beautiful area of mathematical topology, which is all about classifying different types of shape uh, and surfaces, how you can twist them. And again, it started off, we're having this conversation outside, it started off as a very abstract mathematical thing. No one thought they would ever be. Most pure mathematicians would be quite horrified at the thought that their work would have any practical value at all. That's not the reason they do it. Uh, but it turns out that topology is a very, very sensible way of classifying surfaces that we see in gravity and in higher dimensional physics. And it provides you with tools of classifying. If you associate with surfaces with different types of particles that exist in nature, then you can do all sorts of very wonderful things because this bedding of maths that existed long before can then be utilized as a tool. That's, um, going back to that, that's the, the interesting crossover, I think, between science and art and talking about um, usefulness and not knowing if something is useful is actually that's uh, that space to play mm. um, and I think that's yes. what, you know that's that's important in both in science and in art yes um, and maybe I wonder if you know you're talking about now that there's more collaborations and I wonder if it's are we at a level where actually it's, it's not possible to be um, a theoretical physicist and an artist and therefore now we have to collaborate more rather than before, like you were saying? I think it's, it's partly that. Uh, I personally think that it's a natural evolution, especially with so many platforms available to share information. Yeah. I think a crossover was only natural. If you, you see things on the net or whatever, if, if you're a theorist and you see something that reminds you of a, a four-dimensional yeah. string or something, yeah. I, I think that, it, so I don't, I don't think there's any one particular reason for it, yeah. but I agree, it's certainly, uh, there's a lot of it now. Yeah. And I think both disciplines are better for it. Yeah. There's a potential to share funding as well. I don't know what it's like for artists increasingly. <laughs> it always comes down to money, doesn't oh, yeah. it? I mean, there's kind of there's, there's pressure increasingly to create work which you can demonstrate has you know positive social impact, That's which true. is a good and a bad thing for different reasons. I don't know if it's sim similar for the kind of hard sciences, but then may maybe we can team up. Getting money out of anybody, no matter what the discipline, See, is difficult. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, so maybe you could probably apply to the EPS yeah, or yeah, something. Swap <laughs> we'll swap over and see if we. <laughs> get a grant each. <laughs> I don't know, it probably is difficult, but I would like to see more of it. I mean, that would certainly be nice to see more collaborative efforts between. And as you say, it's happening at CERN and various observatories now. Uh, the observatory that I use the telescope in, uh, in LA, uh, the Griffith Park Observatory, they have uh, artistic pieces and things, so it is becoming a lot more common. Can I field any more questions from the group? Just wondered if that was the... the a way of using mathematical language and artistic language, emotional language, mm. to maybe get each field to understand the other. Yes. That, that sort of, it's all about mm. explaining your theory and, and trying to give someone a picture of, mm. of what it actually means to you. Yes, I think so. It's diff it's e it's well, it's easy for us to communicate with other scientists, while well, the physicists, but communicating it with other people, that is, and teaching it, this is why teaching is great. I love teaching. I teach various things at the University of Leicester. And I'm very reluctant just to trot out the same wretched course year after year, because finding new ways of illustrating physical concepts is a creative act in itself. So I, you know, I found ways of describing uh, quantum field theory last year. I'll think of new ways next year because it actually helps me think about it in different ways. So yeah. I think it is very important to embed this creativity in, 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 in different ways, not just, you know, just with physics and equations, but to explain things in other ways is very, very useful for other people and for you yourself, I think. I don't know if that works the same yeah, or not. We're going to see some equations describing yeah. the propagation of sound from you. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. But also, I tend to sort of think about what I'm making in terms of. Occasionally, I will think about it in terms of actual scientific processes. Um, it's like I was saying, when I was making uh, sort of prints and drawings, it was that idea of quantum mechanics that was going into it. But then I think. Um, and your chewing gum, yeah, that's kind of like a wave function. I've just realised, yeah, yeah, in that you have this. It's it's more concentrated towards the centre. So you said people were probably there. Yeah. You have no definite measurement that they were there, but no, you have this have probabilistic. You have this probabilistic distribution that yeah. they were more likely there. Yeah. I guess that's kind of yeah. And also you've done a wave like, function a I little guess bit there. It was there. a snapshot as well. There was no no way of knowing at that point when that piece arrived there, yes. it was like, this is what this looks like now, yeah. this is, has happened over time, 
Um, actually, at the time, I was really worried because the university had sort of pavement cleaners. <laughs> I used to go around the university every few months, and my MA nearly went out of the window. <laughs> nearly um, got cleaned away. Yeah, exactly. But I also think in terms of, like, uh, multidisciplines, I tend to... I make music as well as um, making art, and I do design work and um, sort of make bits of sculptures and, and do some stuff with um, text. And, and so, so all of those things tend to help the other thing. Yeah. And so I think reading about, you know, scrolling through my Facebook feed today, and actually most of the things I follow tend to be science-based, which is odd, but I guess that's sort of from my growing up learning about science as well as wanting to do art. Um, and I think... But if that's a sort of inspirational yeah, connection yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. That's and even if I don't just read them, I'm like, oh my god, amazing, like, 5D wormholes, or there's been a supermassive black hole found. I'm really fascinated in what's going on there. Um, and even if that doesn't actually eventually come out in the artwork. But I think one thing about the collaborations that I guess you need to be careful about is then um, sort of saying about ways of illustrating scientific concepts. That isn't necessarily art. Mm. Um, and that's, and I think that, that's the danger to think about when actually artists are working with, with um, institutions. institutions, is that actually it, you still need to be making, you're still trying to make a piece of art, and actually, you know, I've, I've had those sort of issues with The Sun at Night, and, mm. and also that idea of how you, how you talk to scientists and how they describe what it is they're doing, but you describe, you were describing back to them, the type of thing you're then trying to achieve. Mm. And I find that area really interesting. That's actually, the interface between yeah. one discipline and like communicating. Sometimes we're doing this. It's yeah. like, no, no, no. Because um, originally, when I was researching the sun at night, the guys in the solar physics group, we had like a sort of open discussion about what the sun at night might be like. And um, we sort of came in and said, yeah, we want it to be this like really big, really impressive. One of the most amazing things about those images from NASA are in different wavelengths you get to see different things that are happening with the sun mm. and the electromagnetic there's hydrogen alpha which is actually yeah. see much higher up in the sun yeah. so you get this beautiful crimson red yeah. image white light you see further down and yeah. then you can look in different wavelengths like calcium or yeah. x-ray and see so the for sun us, it was interesting <coughs> there's all these ways of doing it but then it was more important that actually people had a connection and went that's the sun so mm. there was one where it's just completely white with sort of black spots on it and it's like well that to people that is going to look like the moon and so therefore that doesn't <laughs> translate so we had to look, we sort of discussed <coughs> it and went this is what we want and then one of them said oh why don't you why don't you put it on a on a globe and i was like no because like almost all of your research is like these sort of filaments of yeah. electromagnetic radiation on the outside the, and these things are incredible it's this hot gas that we, are be, and they're yeah. distorted by magnetic fields and evolve quite quickly yeah, over time but yeah. if we put that on a sphere like this sort of sphere here, then you wouldn't be able to see that. No, so that's where so, you'd be lost. So yeah, that's where we had these sort of like, just really interesting discussions, but really interesting what their thoughts were. And then in terms of the soundtrack, which for me, I wanted it to be really uh, sort of bass heavy and quite guttural and quite uh, sort of almost, not disturbing, but a little bit sinister. And they, they were talking about all this different classical music that they could put to it. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, that's, that is going to make a really good piece of artwork. It will make a great video on YouTube, but it won't. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, but then the, we, we got a lot from them as well. You know, there were things that they, they designed a little algorithm that would download all the images much quicker, and it was like, brilliant. You, you've, got, you've totally got this. I'm going nowhere near that. <laughs> but then I think your, your work is, is playful and it's powerful because it doesn't look like a piece about apparatus or a diagram. You're talking, yeah. you're making work about time and about gravity um, and chance and yeah. probability, but you're not, it doesn't look like a diagram or an astrolobe or anything. You're no. using, your, in your statement, you describe kind of the, the people or the audience as being kind of players or participants yeah. in this. You know, the, it's, yeah. Yeah, the outcome is is relatable um, in a way which... Yeah, the, yeah, for me that's, that has to be an outcome of the artwork and I tend not to work in gallery spaces, I tend to work um, outside of the gallery space, although I will do uh, sort of print work that relates to the actual installation, but especially for um, uh, Venus in Solvisa, which was in the church, it was the audience were like a church congregation and so they had a role within the actual artwork and, and all the... Um, all the sort of history that comes with going to church and, and that. But then um, I also uh, brewed a beer for the Transit of Venus. So um, I was commissioned by one of the tutors at the um, 
University of Central Lancashire runs a project called In Certain Places, which is uh, they invite artists to come to the city of Preston and create generally um, public artwork. Um, and during, so the transit of Venus that year happened at the same time as the Preston Guild, which happens every 20 years. And so they decided to commission five artists to create pieces uh, in a programme called Subplots for the City. And I was living in a little, I guess, a whole bunch of terraced houses in Preston at the time. I was only living in one. <laughs> I was living amongst a bunch of terraced houses. Um, and just down the road from me was um, just a little bespoke, not hipster at all brewery called Arkwright's Brewery. And it was literally two... Preston lads that had uh, got together and they ran a thing called the beer shop and it was really early on before this had taken off anywhere and it's I think they're still going but they had just a few tanks and um, you brewed beer in there we, yeah and so I brewed beer too did actually. really yeah oh, amazing naturally it has a high gravity but yeah, they, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes but yeah, it's good fun up, we ended up brewing um, a seven percent IPA to celebrate the transit of Venus yeah. and so that that came about through uh, in certain places and I thought the idea that um, perhaps this would happen in the future. So the idea was about recurring time as well. And I guess going back to, in this day and age, we tend to think in much shorter spaces of time, and especially, you know, politicians are in for a few years and they don't really think outside, like, what's going to happen in 50 years, what will happen in 100 years? Whereas people that design parks, gardens, castles, observatories, there was always a, an idea that even though they may never see it in its full Well, and the medieval cathedrals as yeah, well. Yeah, th this would be something for future generations. Yes, yes, so yes. Was, I was also thinking about the legacy, and so we created a, a beer brewing competition uh, to brew a beer for the transit of Venus, and I've still not made the actual trophy that the uh, recipes will be housed in, but the idea is that this will then be looked after um, by the church in Much Hall, <coughs> with the idea that hopefully in 120-ish years' time, someone will look at that and go, oh, they used to do this thing where they brewed a beer for the Transit of Venus. Shall we do that? And hopefully... You should create. have done a whiskey. Uh, it would be today. just about right, you yeah, see. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the time the next one comes Well, around. the idea is it'll just be the recipes in here, so then that will build up an archive of recipes through time. And, of course, I will never know if that actually happens, which I... You, know, that's you kind of do get that with physics, that though. Me. I mean, yeah. Einstein and Dirac would never have known what would have happened to their yeah. theories of general relativity. Uh, yeah. uh, you never have any certainty as a scientist that the things you're working on will prevail or whether they were, you know, great, yeah. unfortunate insights into the wrong direction. Um, so you, there's a, perhaps a, a degree you, just, you don't know what will happen in yeah. the future. Yeah. That degree of uncertainty, I think, is as inherent in science as much as in art. Was really no, good. No, well. Tasted great. You were talking about collaboration between the two fields. Yeah. Um, and as an artist, I'm wondering, mm. as an astronomer with access to lots of data, lots of different kinds yeah. of data, what sort of data you're talking about working with the SEO and with yeah. the images of the sun, what do you enjoy working with and what would you like to see more of hmm. from our community? If you could have anything. I think for me, I just enjoy working with other people. Um, and so, yeah, for the sun at night, it was, it was images of the sun. And that was, that was interesting to work with. I don't know how much further I would take that. It's sort of, um, I guess it was less about inspecting each of the images and more about going, this is incredible. Like, this is something we can't see with our own eyes. So I've always been interested in um, creating sound with data. So that's something. And, and I'm not sure it... I'm trying to think if it matters what it is. It probably does matter what it is, but I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, and weirdly, there was... Um, I don't know if anyone's read Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. But, um, so the, the chewing gum piece that I did, um, I remembered that... And actually, I think my interest in quantum physics came from that and Schrodinger's cat experiment that I always thought about. But that was, he, he sonified um, the data from flocks of seagulls within that book, and it created the most horrendous cacophony of noise. And so that, that's a sort of uh, fictionalised version of something that people have started doing. So, yeah, that, that's something. I suppose, for me, it's something that's... Mm, there's got to be something in the history of it as well, and the sort of poetics of it. But I guess until I see what the thing is, I wouldn't know. 
What have you got in your archive that you think um, would would be? There's, there's uh, so much stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking there's with Trappist people have um, looked at the transits of the planets, and I know they've yeah. done something where every time the planet transit, it make it makes a little noise, and yeah. so it creates this fantastic track where you've got Amazing. all seven of the planets transiting, each with a different pitch. And so that I guess that would be quite a generative piece that constantly changes. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. the 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 system is. It will. It has a sort of equilibrium, and so eventually yeah. it repeats itself, and so you yeah. get this sort of nice. Um, Although, because of dynamics, do it enough times, it will slide slightly different. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. it won't actually come back to the same point. Yeah. Did I think they think at the moment maybe Travis is stable? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but, and then there's sort of astroseismology data with yeah. the sun and stuff. There's all sorts of ways that I've seen people cut um, things and make turn it from this sort of silent image into mm. yeah sound, and it's definitely been a great way yeah. for people to engage. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's that, at the moment. I think that's quite a big sort of area with it. That taking data, whether it be um, there was a project recently around uh, Somerset House with King's College about pollution levels, um, and they were looking at sort of working with musicians and artists as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't answer that fully. <laughs> Sorry. Can I just just yeah. interject there because something coming to my mind. My memory is pretty appalling. But I think there's only one surviving photograph of the previous transit of Venus. No. Uh, well, there was, do you mean the one? Like a, a slide, a, a glass. There was probably a drawing. It wouldn't have been a photograph. It was in 1663, I think. I thought it was every 120 years. Uh, there, there may have been later ones, but the first one, Jeremiah Horrocks sketched it. There wouldn't have been a yeah. photograph. Okay, let's believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they come around in pairs, don't they? It's so it's every eight, eight years and then loads of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I did, but I, the first one was drawn, I think, not photographed. I, th I think there's a story of the last one, because eight yeah. years ago, um, yeah. and then 120 years before that, they, they come in these two eight-year eight pairs. Yeah. Yeah. The scientists from England who were like, right, we really must make this one, otherwise we'll be waiting <laughs> another eight years. And people did actually miss the transit. And uh, have gone to the wrong parts no. of the No, yes, no, day. yeah. Didn't have their yeah, so it was 2004 and then 2012. Yes, that's right. So in 2012, yeah, it was it was dark. You said you saw it in the morning. I did. You? I was. Yeah. We did. I was with Patrick Moore. We went down to Selsey Beach at four or five in the morning, which was very very strange. And we just, the clouds parted. It was cloudy and wet over much of the UK, but we did see it through a special telescope. And then we went back and had champagne and cake. It Amazing. was. <laughs> it's awfully nice. I had champagne actually, that morning. <laughs> One of the things you talk about was uh, photograph slides, though. There are, I don't know whether you can still get them, whether in the they must still be in the archives at Cambridge. This was the first ever photographic proof of general relativity. Because uh, what Einstein realized, what Eddington, Arthur Eddington realized, is that uh, it's not just particles and planets that are deviated by gravity, but so too is starlight. And I wrote to Einstein and got Einstein to do the numbers and find out how much starlight would be bent by uh, passing near the sun. Now, the only problem is with stars near the sun during the day, it's very difficult. So what they did was, what Eddington did is he took a photograph of the night sky where the total eclipse was going to be six months before and then took a picture. They went to various remote locations and took a photographs at the time of the eclipse where the stars were there just at the moment of totality. And by comparing the two DVA, the plate from before and the plate afterwards, uh, they found the starlight was a bent by precisely the amount given by general relativity, not Newtonian gravity. Wow. And I thought that was a lovely com coming together. If you look at the plates, they're in reverse, so you get the black stars on this white plate, on this wonderful glass plate. This, uh, that was a coming together, because they had to use photographic techniques, because it's very difficult yeah. uh, to, to get the starlight accurate in position enough to be able to measure it. Uh, but that, that old, there's something about old photographs and technology from a scientific purpose that I think do have an artistic oh, yeah, I think connection amazing, to them. Yeah. There's something really romantic about that sort of um, the fact that they've been developed, yeah. that sort of blurring, especially yeah. There's something about something being shifted into the negative that's fantastic. Yeah. I think that's oh what God. I was going to try and get to was that although Didn't there were these amazing images being back from Cassini and millions yeah. mm. and millions of miles away, actually going backwards and seeing these older, <coughs> yeah, sometimes interpretations or mm. you know, they're they're not as precise as we have now, but they've they've got kind of just as much. They've got more yeah, as feel, so yeah, yeah. So was it, was it Shackleton that took a load out in the Arctic? Yeah. Yes, I think, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen some of those plates, and 
but then just the idea that he was out there as well adds to it. It's like those, those I think those are the things that... I think it's because being. there's more of a human connection yeah. with them, isn't there? I mean, if you go to the Lowell Observatory, Le uh, Percival Lowell, who was the first, who became obsessed with the idea that there was canals on Mars, uh, he wasn't a very great, he wasn't necessarily a great astronomer, but he did use his fam substantial family wealth to build this observatory in Arizona. And it's still going, and you can go and visit it, you can go and use the telescope. And his drawings of Mars are pretty terrible, mm. but... They're so, there's something charming about the fact, and actually what he was saying, that there is a life on Mars and it's not too different, is not too different from the suppositions we have to say. Of course, we don't think that they would be building canals and channeling water. Uh, but and he made these 3D globes where he, he, made, he got globes and he put the, the, the colours on of Mars and, and drew these lines that he thought yeah, these, the where he thought these canals yeah. were. Um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, there's something wonderful about that. Uh, science that's profoundly yeah. wrong but created these wonderful artefacts yeah. is a wonderful thing. It is, yeah. That's yes. That, that mm. and, and the sort of social connection as well. Maybe I'm thinking of the, the beer festival and having a yeah. kind of beer competition and the beer inspired by something such as the transit of Venus in yeah. itself. Is, yeah. Well, you hit on an important point, is that, and we laugh at Lowell now for saying, you know, goodness me, who on earth would think a race of Martians would build canals? But at the time Lowell lived in, Ship canals and canals were the highest form of technology and seen as uh, a great sense of technological achievement. And very often what we do when we look back on scientists of the past who made predictions we now know to be wrong, is we take them out of the context of the era they lived in. You can't do that, yeah. actually. Uh, Lowell was very much the product of his era. Shipbuilding and canals were a sign of prosperity and great technical achievement. It's only natural you would think that aliens on another world might also be doing the same thing if they have access to those materials. Presumably the same with the old photographic slides as well. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We're looking back now at these lovely things that are no longer used to produce those images, and we have this kind of romanticised view of, of what they look like. But at the time they were being used, okay, they yes. were the height of technology. They were, yes. Um, these arcane sort of photographic machines. That, and just that time span. Yeah. There's a wonderful, there's another piece of technology that touches on what you said, it's not, would not be used now, you would just use computers. It was, uh, it was the thing that was used by Clyde Thomas to discover Plato called the Blink Comparator. And what he did was he photographed the night sky, and that's on one side of the plate, and then you have another plate taken to a couple of nights later, and any object that's moving in the, will appear as a dot moving back and forth between the night sky, and he wow. scanned thousands of these plates looking for Pluto, and then finally one day, notice this dot moving back and forth, and that's how Pluto was discovered. Like and this is one... It is, it's like, it's like that. And it's this wonderful piece of brass technology, and what a wonderful name, the Blink Comparator. Isn't that... Mag we, what do we call things today? I mean, you know, they We've lost that romanticism as well. I don't know. There's like um, there's all sorts of weird names for sort of scientist thing, wasn't it? Is it the the bald? What's the thing about the black holes, where there's the the no hair black hole? Oh, the no hair theorem. Yeah, yes. The no hair yeah. theorem. It's like you've still got. Yes, weird and wonderful way. we do. Again, they are misleading because black holes don't have any hair uh, in the conventional sense. Uh, uh, the particles don't have colour, they don't have flavour. Uh, but we still <laughs> insist on developing very logical abstract ideas and then giving them human names. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the hairy dog theorem. Yes. The spherical kind of dog which has no head or legs but it has hair all over. It's how mathematicians view a dog. Yes, it's actually a topological <laughs> problem about orientation of things on surfaces. It's the hair would have to lie flat, but where does it lie flat? You know, yeah. it's a sphere, of course. Yes, yeah. that's... It, it, it's, it, it's taking it. We don't wonder why, but well, there's some, clearly some human need in scientists yeah. to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would I uh, tell you something that's I'm concocting in my mind to answer that problem if I didn't have a common... Uh, An analogy or a yeah, metaphor, or, which is kind of all art is, really. Yeah. It's a stand-in, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of a token for something which really exists in here and arguably, you know, many of the sciences kind of, you know, operate in the same way. Going back to what you were saying about the images, the old film images of um, stars. So it's a kind of memento moris in more than one sense, so because, of course, the people who produced them are now, you know, deceased. The methods are dying out. But also the stars are dead because many of the stars we see in the night sky have, you know, extinguished because light takes such a long time to reach us. 
Yes. Um, although the ones photographed won't have deceased yet, they are okay. very long later. Uh, but certainly, stars in far distant galaxies, yes. I've got carried away. <laughs> so, yeah. so the ones we see are still alive? Yeah, the ones we see in the local uh, uh, surrounding us, yes, they are. Uh, you can see with your naked eye. Actually, it's interesting. What's the furthest thing you can see with the naked eye is actually if you get to a dark sky, it's the Andromeda Galaxy, which is about two and a half million light years away. Oh. It just looks like a faint smudge, but it is impressive that you can see. And if you translate that back in time, there would have been no human beings, it would have been dinosaurs roaming the earth. So the light set off and the earth has changed substantially. Over. There's a whole yeah. civilization here now, semi-intelligent civilization, which hopefully won't destroy itself. Uh, and uh, that has all evolved over time. Uh, you do wonder yeah. if anything left the, the, you know, anything was looking at the Milky Way back then yeah. would, have, would have, may have had similar questions. Wow. Um, that we're all going crazy about with um, gravitational waves and LIGO. It's mm. also very difficult to try and represent and also has um, a lot of links with sound, with the chirps. Um, and yeah, I wonder whether you've considered helping us explain or, or convey emotion about the gravitational waves and the things that we're seeing with those or the sounds um, that, that they produce. Yeah, I'd love to. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't considered it any further because I didn't know. I didn't know about them. What is? Can you explain further what that is? Uh, yeah, I can give it a go. I mean, it yeah. sort of comes down to all the, all the relativity and stuff. It's it's a new way of looking at our universe outside of the electromagnetic spectrum, outside yeah. of light, um, by using the waves that um, bodies give off as they collapse into each other. As yeah. two black holes, for example, spin together and collapse yeah. and merge, and it means that we can see astonishingly far um, and it's a really brand new baby technology that we uh, are gonna hopefully run away with and make incredible discoveries oh, amazing as soon as that ha started in cambridge then or oh no that's a yeah. whole global it's global. been a global yeah. phenomena it, it, the reason it's excited is because things like starlight are blocked by dust in the galaxy right. and there's things that will stop it gravitational waves are if you like traveling through the essence of nature itself yeah. uh, it's interesting because when the gravitational waves collide with the detector <laughs> they don't just distort space, they distort time as well. Yeah. So you don't just get a rod extending and, con and, and contracting, but also with time as well, there'll be a slight yeah. increase, decrease in time. So, so does this then sort of um, give credence to your idea that actually there is, you need a theory for something outside of time? Um, because actually time isn't... I, no, I, I wouldn't say that because Einstein's theory of general relativity accounts for gravitational waves very well. Yeah. Uh, and as, uh, as you said, it is a very exciting because it is potentially a way of probing right back to the Big Bang, to the beginning of cre the whole of creation itself, yeah. in a way that we simply could not have done just using radiation. Very, yeah, that sounds amazing. It's, it's a yeah. very difficult technology to, to explain or convey because everything is so small and so distant. Yeah. And how do you observe these things? What is... what? I'm guessing I'm thinking what apparatus or what thing is it that's looking at it? So we have, um, at the moment we have LIGO, which is two, um, two very long rods, if you like, that are yeah. perpendicular to each other. And we, we wait for events that sort of squeeze or stretch in right. one of these dim dimensions. Um, and it means that we can, we can tell that something big gravitationally occurred, yeah. although I think like cows tipping over next door to LIGO also caused... Yeah, they do. <laughs> Nowhere near as cosmologically yeah, as significant. Yeah. Cause them to tip over. And so it's, yeah. it's been but they're in two locations, right? The point is, though, if the yeah. event happens and the, uh, a load of these waves pass through the Earth, yeah. they hit in different, slightly different times, different okay. places, so you know and then you can correlate that it wasn't a cow falling over. Yeah. It really was two <laughs> massive black holes merging at the end of the universe or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That sounds amazing. I've just been rereading... I think, you know, I touched on um, Douglas Adams before, but for me as an artist, a lot of um, often fiction um, tends to sort of be a way of getting back into science as well. And then through that sort of, I guess, reinterpreting it and coming up with ideas myself. So I find, I find that helpful. Weirdly helpful, like, it's just reminded me of if you have a, an impressionist as an impression of someone, I often find it's easier to copy the impressionist than it is to copy the person who they're impersonating. <laughs> so I don't know if that, that just popped into my mind. So. But um, I've just been rereading um, His Dark Materials and Northern Lights uh, by Philip Pullman. And that was, that's interesting when you were talking about gravitational waves and things passing through things, they're talking about dust in that. And there's a lot of talk in that about, I guess, yeah, what is our soul, but also what quantum mechanics is and, and how things, yeah, 
dissolve into the universe and have entropy. So there's a lot of those scientific concepts that come into that. And I guess then I'm wondering if, if, if there is any fiction or other artworks that have inspired you. I love science fiction. I love science fiction. Uh, I love the idea of the transporter from Star Trek because you see it, don't you? You think, what would that feel like? Yeah. You know, what would it be like falling asleep? Would it be like a general anaesthetic? And if it goes wrong, would you, you know, presumably you would want to not be being put back together as it goes wrong. So yeah, I did Star Trek and Doctor Who I always quite liked. Uh, I, I, did, I did like read Doug, a lot of Douglas Adams' stuff is very good. Um, so I'm not, I couldn't say to you hand on heart that I had a good classical education because I did. So art and reading wasn't a, something I did a lot of, I'm yeah. afraid. I was grabbed by the sciences very early on. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I certainly think, I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't go to art galleries, uh, in fact, but if I, I, I do find that people that are very interesting in art, I get more out of talking to them than seeing their work very often. Yeah. Um, it's mostly because some will, I go to an art gallery sometimes and people say, oh look, there's inner turmoil represented in cubism, it just looks like colours to me. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. But if you talk to the person who does that, who's done it, there, there's the story behind how it came about, and this is very, again, it's similar to science, isn't it? Yeah. The story about how it came about and, and what it might mean is more as greater than the sum of what they've done. And in the same way, science is very similar. The, the, the paths we took to answer the questions are questions that were generated when we were answering them, uh, far more, often far more insightful than the initial question that started it all off. I think you're both answering the same question. <laughs> you're answering the factual way and you're trying yeah. to put the emotion back in. Could be. Could be. Could be, yeah. Could be. Like the Anton Deck of... <laughs> 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 so soon, I think we might take a couple of questions from Twitter if there have been any. Um, been lots of retweets. Lots of retweets. <laughs> I've got a burning question, but if we haven't had any from social media, I'm just going to jump right into it. And this is one for Paul. Can you please explain to me a little bit about interferometric imaging? Because I understand this is used by theoretical physicists and art historians and conservationists alike. The short answer is no. <laughs> the light, slightly longer answer is I'll try. I don't know a lot about it, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, it's, pros it's perhaps used by experimentalists to check for theoretical physics results, maybe things like neutron diffraction. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't really elaborate as to the technicalities as to, uh, as to how it works. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> all, all I know from the kind of art side of it is that it is used to look at disturbances in the layers of paint in particularly old paintings. Okay. So, like, as conservation. A, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, like, if there's been a, a restoration, you know, hundreds of years ago, or something has been added to it and then it's been covered over by okay. other layers of paint, you can you can detect very minute fractures and disturbances in the surface. My guess then is you work, might use different layers, different types of uh, electromagnetic radiation, and scatter it, and the, the, the types of scatter you get off it gives you something uh, about the, the the medium, the things that's caused the scatter and maybe you can build up a picture from that. You Maybe certain types of materials scatter things in a certain types of way, and if you see that there, then you know that that's happened. That would be my guess. Okay. But All I know is it involves optic beams and mirrors. I don't know what an optic beam <laughs> is or a mirror, but that's the images cool. often look a little bit like ultrasounds. Right. You kind of have these concentric... Circles. So it's more of a contour map than showing yes, where, exactly. where, you, where there's an intense period, uh, a region of intensity uh, where it's absent somewhere else. So uh, I would imagine that's what it is. Okay. It just interested me because it's something used, as I say, by art historians and conservationists, but also by kind of, you know, um, experimental theoretical mm. physicists. And I was just like, bloody hell, what is it being used for other yeah. than, you know, Everything. scanning paintings? <laughs> well, presumably one could use it with particles, right? Yes. Uh, there might be other applications where you want to look for particles or particle interactions. You might use it. Um, I don't know. I can't tell you whether it's used in CERN. I believe in CERN they smash atoms together to try and get find out the constituent elements of, uh, of fundamental particles. But um, in what context? I could imagine it being useful for particle physics, but I couldn't swear to it or, or give you any references or citations, I'm afraid. <laughs> Describes which are the sort of yeah. sound based ones. Do they exist? Are they tucked away in a cupboard somewhere that you can get out? Or um, are, they, are they done in real time? Yeah, uh, they tend to be real time, got? but then there's documentation online. So 
Um, the chewing gums, I mean, that's, that's the thing with, I suppose, uh, public art and installations is that how do you then, how do people go and see that? And it, it, I suppose it tends to be on the internet or it tends to be like, um, with the sun at night, I'm trying to take that on a bit of a tour. Because um, one of the things for me that's interesting is now that it's a sort of finished, it sort of feels like a finished piece visually, but actually the sound is what is really interesting for me now and how people are affected by the sound. And that actually as it tours, it builds up a kind of, um, the soundtrack gets added to. Um, so the church organist in Leeds improvised over the top of it and we recorded that and that's been added to the soundtrack. So in each location it's been, it's had a little bit sort of added to it. Um, and then, yeah, basically they appear on my website. I've got a website for the sun at night and it's got, sort of, at the moment, it's got some images and a sort of short clip and then the soundtrack exists on SoundCloud so you could actually listen to that with or without the sun. Um, and then, yeah, all the other work is sort of, I guess, that's a really important part of the process of making art is then the documentation of it. But live art is, yeah, it's tricky. It's, yeah. What do you mean by documentation, actually? Do you mean writing it up? Um, yeah, a whole mixture of stuff, I would say. That's so, funny. I never imagined you guys sitting there with a notebook yeah. writing up your experiments. Yeah, my That's, chewing, my chewing gum what piece a fantastic to, idea. <laughs> yeah, I had to write quite a lot for the, the chewing gum piece um, and ended up you know, producing a little booklet that had images, uh, the research that led into it, because ori originally I was interested in that sort of those old style piano rolls mm. uh, and, and sort of mapped out the chewing gum into MIDI and put it through a synthesizer and listened to it as a piano and stuff like that. So um, yeah, so we'd kind of documented that. I suppose with uh, once you're out of university, you don't have to document it as such, but I think it's really helpful to write about it and write mm. what you're thinking about. Mm. So yeah, like I guess like scientists, we've got notebooks. Generally mine have... Mm, Actually, it's more writing than drawing, actually, but I tend to draw on the backs of envelopes. That's, and that's interesting. Because my notebook is more drawings than writing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the other way around. <laughs> we should compare them. We should, yeah. It's amazing. The scientists and the artists yeah. sketchbooks. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 As do used to be really good, like cheap three quid black sketchbooks that were like moleskin, but they've stopped. Yeah, or they're no longer three quid. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got one quick question go back a little bit, but you mentioned the event horizon. Yes. Um, and the first thing that popped into my head was like an atmosphere, but I'm guessing it's probably not like that at all. No, it's, it's not. A bit more about it. Yes. So it's not an atmosphere. So what happens is, is that there is, you've got this star that's collapsed. You have this. We don't think that it's really a singularity at the centre. That's because general relativity breaks down at the centre of a black hole. But there is a, a, an almost infinitely thin shell surrounding the black hole where if light passes through, uh, it can't then get back out. Okay, so we call it also, it's known as a null surface or a light sphere. It's not actually emitting light. You wouldn't know you've crossed it necessarily in some of the really big uh, black holes. Of the black. So nothing special happened. There's no little marker to say this is the event horizon. But it is simply that point surrounding the black hole. So it would be a sphere where if anything traveling, uh, any, any photons would no longer be able to escape the pull of the black hole and would have to fall into the center. Okay, so that's all the event horizon is. And we think the interesting boundary between quantum mechanics and general relativity occurs on or very near the event horizon. We think uh, that the, the, the radiation that occurs via the Hawking mechanism is probably particles and antiparticles coming in and out of existence, but occasionally they don't annihilate each other. One falls into the hole and the other one escapes and that process. Uh, but the, the event horizon has some very special geometry and it's very, it creates some very interesting things about it. Uh, and we see all sorts of interesting things in theoretical physics because there is an horizon there. It distinguishes it from ordinary classical physics in some way. So it is, it's, although there's, no, no, there's nothing visual about it, there is something very special about it in terms of geometry and in terms of physics. So is it, when you said it's infin, infinitesimally small, is it literally then just the bit between that and that? Like literally, it's just literally. Like where two things are together. You can escape, you can escape, you can escape, you're doomed. <laughs> That's it's it. That's, like that. It is literally like that. But it's a sphere of yeah. that surrounding the entire black hole, yeah. <laughs> are there not sort of enormous changes in what's happening outside and inside? It? Well, if you're inside, you can't communicate with the outside. Uh, you can't send a light signal. There is a wonderful diagram, and I have no idea who came up with it. That show, I wish we had some paper. And a pa Can I draw it? Can I draw it? You should have brought your sketch. No, no, no. Okay, I'm going to try and draw this. Um, that really does explain the situation better than any equation. So I'm going to imagine. Okay, um, 
So imagine here we have the, this is the star that's collapsed. And if you imagine this is a picture that's evolving over time. So I have the equator of the star here, yeah? And it collapses and it forms a black hole, okay? And we do this squiggly line here to represent everything we don't know in physics. It's called a singularity. And that's surrounded by something called, well, I've just mentioned the event horizon, okay? So this is what we would think of as a black hole. Now imagine you've got something falling in and you imagine you've got something out here that remains the same distance. So we've got someone falling here into the black hole, and we've got somebody out here that's going to capture his light signals. So what we can do, we can represent the light at a 45 degree angle. Okay, and this is something we call a light cone. So this guy over here is carrying on about his business. But what you find is that as you slowly, I'll put it up to the camera in just a minute, the light cone starts to shift until eventually it's on the horizon and the last transmission takes longer and longer. So you see, uh, so this is the guy, imagine this is, this is the observer. He's outside the black hole, this guy's falling in. He sends a light beam, it's received some time there. Because his space, because his, his path is curved by space time, these light beams, they take longer and longer to reach him. So eventually the last one, the last ray of light he sends, travels along the event horizon and can never escape. So these pulses of light can be represented by this very complicated geometry can actually be represented in this nice way. It's not a great drawing, I'll admit, and it's perhaps more confusing than I intended I to be. Like but you get this, <laughs> the, the, the point is the distance between the lights as he measures mm. takes longer and longer, and eventually he concludes he doesn't get anything else. But for him, he's sending them at the same rate. Right. But because space-time is so curved for him here, uh, time is affected differently to him over there. This is why when you're very close to a black hole, everything outside the black hole appears to be moving very, very quickly. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so do you would have a different measure, to, but you wouldn't notice it, right? Oh, I see. That's the yeah. thing. But anybody from your, a different reference frame would measure if it's from you taking a lot longer to, to reach, and you would have that, especially the, not all black holes are static, some of them rotate. So it is possible if you are a massive rotating black hole, if you get too close to it, you'll be dragged around and time will go very, very slow for you and will pass very, you know, thousands of years could pass on the outside, whilst for you only seconds have passed. Right so. inception. Yes, yes. Uh, and well, I actually not see this. Did Interstellar, I thought. Did you see Interstellar? That was one of the best films involving gravity. I didn't realise. Uh, Kip Thorne, who was one of the early pioneer black, uh, black hole pioneers, did a lot of very good stuff. He actually went in and filled the blackboards in the, the, the scientist's office with real calculations Amazing. and real diagrams. Uh, oh, and right. in honour of this, Michael Caine, who plays the scientist, grew a little goatee because <laughs> Kip Thorne had a goatee as well. But it, the pictures that we draw in relativity are often far more, are very, try to be very insightful. Yeah. Didn't the VFX guys work really close? <laughs> with them as well on, yes. on what that looked like. Yeah. It was published on yes. the representation. That's, that, that is what we think. Yeah, that is what we think travelling through a wormhole, travelling through a black hole would be like. They use real physics. They use, they, they, what they, I believe, don't hold me to it, I believe they light, ray traced light as it would be scattered through this enormous space-time uh, dislocation, this uh, in immense curvature, and they got uh, what we think it would look like to yeah. pass through. Amazing. And can you explain that kind of halo effect or the kind of you know, around the edge of the event horizon as it's... As yeah, well, it's, it's sort of a halo. That's where we think that the particle... If, 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 the part, if the black hole is going to lose its mass and evaporate, we think that the thing that's generating that... Uh, because although we have a vacuum, we have space around us, it's not absent. Particles come in and out of existence all the time, but they do it in pairs. So they uh, arrive together and then they annihilate each other. So overall, it's still a vacuum. But if that happens around a black hole, it could be the case that sometimes one of them escapes... And that's what we think is this mechanism that's generating the Hawking radiation. But it's very, very slow until the black hole gets much smaller and then the process really speeds up. Um, I was just I'm still stuck on something that you said about the, 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 the bad science producing quite an interesting visual in the, the canals on Mars. Yeah. And how I really doubt that any of my failed artwork accidentally provides some insightful <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I'm actually really fixating on the concept of failure this year for some reason, it just um, because it's so uh, integral to an artist's practice, and yet people so rarely discuss it or know how to talk about it. And um, what little I know of science, especially like theoretical side of the science, is that a lot of it is kind of never 
reaching a goal and never kind of getting an answer and going, yes, I've done it, well done. Uh, so I, I just um, just personally mm. wanted to, uh, uh, would, would you talk a little bit about failure in science? Failure is very important. Actually, it's more important than discovery because when something doesn't work, it's more insightful than why it works. So, uh, I, I, there are two types of teaching to theoretical physics. You go in and cheat the students and pretend you've done it all and it's brilliant and it works. Or you're the guy like me who loses a minus sign <laughs> and spends the rest of the lecture wondering why the universe didn't end last week. <laughs> it's actually very important. Uh, i touch on it first from a teaching point of view. So, I, when I teach physics, I teach it with lots of worked examples because I think it's very important for students to see you working as a physicist at the board. And when we work as physicists, we many, many reams of paper on wrong ideas, on maths that we haven't done right. There are lots of mistakes to make. And to pretend that doesn't happen is, it goes like to go back to what we said with uh, producing image, high resolution images of the planets and then people see it for the real time. It, it really does bring down expectations, it, it, it doesn't do us any good. So I think failure is very, very important and it's okay for students to realise that these equations and concepts are very hard. You are probably going to fail a few times, you're going to make a wrong answer, you're going to come up with an astoundingly beautiful view of the universe that experimentalists probably in the middle US find is not like that at all and we learn the universe is quite different. But that's okay because as far as I can tell, that's the way you learn how it actually works. Getting secrets from nature is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Probing science and understanding the physical world is very difficult. And failure, for me, is equal to success as well. They are very important signs of the same coin. And I think for a lot of students, and perhaps a lot of people in science, when something doesn't work, working out why it doesn't work is its own teaching method. And you figure out, actually, if I'd just done that, that would have worked much easier. So I think it's important. <laughs> like, is, like, uh, really I don't think we have that long. I could go. <laughs> yes, yes, I did spend half a year words working on this abstract type of black hole, which I really liked. I just loved the geometry of it, and I was convinced that it didn't evaporate in the way that Hawking suggested, and I was quite excited. And then I realised three months in, I'd made a spectacular, monumental error in one of the integrals I evaluated. Uh, Unforgivable, actually, because it was a standard integral. I could have looked it up in a book. So uh, it's, it was really quiet. But I thought, why? D then I went back and thought, why did I think that? And I realised that I thought that it was it was okay because what that integral was telling me was was a physical answer. It didn't. The answer wasn't unphysical, and this is why you have to be careful in theoretical physics because you can get the right answer by the wrong way. And conversely, you can get the wrong answer with completely plausible te uh, methods. So it just requires. But with no experience of failure, then you would that that treading that type would be awfully difficult, right? So I think we should, you know, look back fondly on our failures. And that is one of mine. It was a Schwarzschild antidote black hole, and I've never worked on them since. <laughs> but well, that's not true. I am working on one now. But uh, it, it was an important lesson. Uh, it was a very, very instructive lesson, also to look up integrals rather than try and tackle them straight on, because you know this guy had worked it out back in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> the shame of it. <laughs> I think, like you were saying, well, it's important to to, in science and in art, pursue what it is that really interests you. Yes. So actually, if that is going down a weird path, yeah, yeah. you don't know what it is and you don't know where it's going, actually, it is really important. It That's is. how real, genuine discoveries are made by people being passionate and interested. Well, in, you've got to care. Yeah. yeah, you've got yeah. to care. You can't work on somebody else's idea, really, uh, not beyond the PhD, but you, you do have to, you have to care. Uh, Somebody said to me once, I shall name no names, I ought to work on more sensible problems, but the more sensible problems are not, they're not always very interesting yeah. to me. So yeah. I like the more interesting things that are slightly on the edge. On that hopefully motivational <laughs> note, I'm going to draw the conversation to a close, but uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. So can we please put a quick uh, round of applause to David and Paul for coming out tonight. <laughs> Um, if you've enjoyed the talk, please, please do fill out the little feedback forms. Um, there's a pot of pens floating around somewhere. Uh, we have another talk next month on the 11th of July um, with a psychologist, uh, 
David Walton and an autistic artist, Suzanne Cruz, on the subject of art, the brain and behaviour, which includes, you know, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, uh, neurodiversity in general. Um, location is still to be announced, but if you would like to know more about it, put your email address on the feedback form and we'll put you on the mailing list. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And thanks for our host as well. It's yeah. very good. So well done. Well done, Sam. And the production crew. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for reminding me, Martin Steve as well, the cameraman and our live editor, uh, for all of his hard work. Yes. Well. Yes. Go on, one more. One more for the camera crew. Thanks, that was great. It was good yeah, fun, wasn't it? Was really it? Good, yeah. <laughs>